to you know welcome everybody who is going to be joining us. Uh, welcome to our Times Evoke Evolve session, where we bring you conversations with people whose work is changing the world. We are very delighted to welcome our distinguished guest today. Professor James Heckman, economist, was awarded the Nobel Prize in 2000. His work on human development is absolutely renowned, as is his commitment to using economics to create policy that strengthens human lives. Professor Heckman is the director of the Center for the Economics of Human Development at the University of Chicago, and we're very deeply privileged to be able to converse with Professor Heckman about his work and his ideas. Um, thank you so much for this valuable opportunity, Professor Heckman. Thank you very, very much. Well, it's my pleasure. Great. So um, I'll start right away, Professor Heckman, by asking you, how would you describe the core of your work? Well, I've, I've done a lot of different things. So the core of the work that you're describing in your interview, uh, in your introduction to the interview, is basically uh, trying to understand the aspects of what determines human development and therefore what determines uh, uh, the source of equality, inequality among human beings, the ability to function in life. I'm strongly convinced, and I think the evidence is very strong, that there are multiple skills that are required for success in life. And that those skills, uh, many of them can be augmented, supplemented, and that provides an avenue for improving human welfare. So I think what I've been doing for the last 20 years, really, or longer, but certainly in the last 20 years, has been to try to understand what these skills are, uh, how to measure them, uh, and to move against the kind of standard conventions about what they are, how they're produced, what are the important sources of these skills, mm -hmm. and uh, what we might do in the way of interventions and supplements to family and social life to stimulate those skills. So in some real sense, my quest is trying to understand uh, human uh, agency, if you will, autonomy, the ability of individuals to function not just by themselves, but also in groups. And so that's been a major theme of my work is really understanding the skills, uh, the capabilities, if you will, of what people are, and, and to really try to understand that the, the gaps that we see between people, while not strictly solely, I should say, caused by the um, skills, skills are a major determinant of those gaps. And that means that we have a way to construct social policy that people have not previously regarded. And there are a lot of bad ideas, there's a lot of bad thinking, and a lot of it is not willful. A lot of it, I think, is just uh, plain old ignorance and the fact mm -hmm. that uh, you know people, <laughs> there's a phenomenon that once people leave school, they generally don't learn anything. <laughs> and, and so the ideas, so if you get somebody who's quite old, even 20 years out of school, their ideas are probably very obsolete. And it's not just that I'm trying to get them up to speed, it's that those ideas are very important in understanding what we can do Absolutely. and how we might do it. Absolutely. In fact, I wanted to ask you, you know, Professor Heckman, you say that there are two main aspects um, to human flourishing. One is the cognitive, and the other is the non-cognitive. Now, this is really interesting. We hear a lot about the cognitive part of human flourishing, but if you could tell us a little bit more about the non-cognitive and also about your overall idea of human flourishing. Well, I think the dichotomy you mentioned, um, by the way, many people hate the word non-cognitive <laughs> because most everything we do as human beings as an element of cognition. So mm -hmm. it's not like we're just thinking about it from the medulla or some gut reflex, <laughs> although there's some of that. But there is, uh, but what, what I'm trying to make is a difference between the kind of skills that receive so much attention. For example, if you look at uh, most of the PISA scores, the OECD, mm -hmm. international organizations, many, many people are looking at test scores of children 
and adults too, but mostly children, school age children. And using that as a measure of trying to understand just who succeeds, who's failing, and what are the important phenomena and what, what are the important traits needed in life. And to think that schools are the major producer of those traits. So we've actually, this is, this is really, a, it's in some sense, I consider this a kind of consequence of, uh, of a learned ignorance, I think. I wouldn't say willful, but I think learned. Mm -hmm. In the last 50 or 60 years, even the last 100 years, you know, the IQ test was only really developed in France about 100 years ago, maybe 110 years ago. Uh, Stan Benet was this French psychologist, and the Americans took this idea and really ran with it. And the idea of IQ, and it's now worldwide. Students of all varieties from uh, are all around the world, in particular, are looking at the uh, IQ and achievement test scores. And these are the measures that we use in our debate. But we know, and if we go back to our roots, and I mean ancient roots, I mean, India, of course, has some of the most ancient roots uh, in terms of ideas and in terms of teaching, moral and uh, philosophical teachings. But for example, if we look at the structure of, uh, of things that our, 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 our parents teach us, or the parents used to teach us, the kind of moral values, the ability to stay on task. I don't know what the appropriate Indian proverb is, but you know, in, in the West, we frequently talk about Aesop's fables. Mm -hmm. And the story is one about the, the tortoise and the hare. Mm -hmm. I know that India is so plugged into British culture that, that but I, there must be a, a, an indigenous fables. Indian myth. <laughs> yes. But those kinds of traits, became kind of neglected. And there was this whole era of what used to be called cognitive, and still is called cognitive psychology. And what we became convinced by was that things that we measure by achievement tests, IQ tests, and by these achievement tests, which are different from IQ tests. Achievement tests are measuring how much a children uh, master a subject. So we could, you know, whether or not they can do arithmetic or how they well they know the history of the country or how well they can write a, a, a phrase. Uh, but those things are important. I'm not denying it. They're, those tasks, those skills are very important. We know that. Mm -hmm. But we also know that something like IQ is not by any means the strongest predictor of who succeeds in life. We know that IQ is, if you look at the total present value of earnings, just the the earnings that individuals get over their whole lifetime, and you ask how much of that variability is explained by IQ, it's somewhere between five and 10% at most. Mm -hmm. It's probably not even that, depending on the, the, the environment and the culture. So what is the other trait? Well, there are a lot of other factors that go into it. The way that markets perform, uh, the, the re discrimination and a bunch of other but in addition, we know that these social and emotional traits, the ability to stay on task, the ability to regulate oneself, the ability to persevere and to work with others, these social and emotional skills, and then these skills that have to do with the structure of, um, of underlying uh, uh, decision making. For example, time preference, the ability to deal with uncertainty, and the ability to deal with forms of uncertainty that are really truly uncertain. And by that, I mean, where there's no probability that we can really assign to states of the world, but there's something fundamental economists have called and psychologists now call that ambiguity. So the ability to deal with these different things and executive functioning, the ability to, to see a problem in a whole and to address it. You know, rarely when we go out in the workplace or even in academia, uh, what Kant and many others have called practical wisdom is really very important. And a crucial part of practical wisdom is the ability to see the problem, understand what the problem is that faces the individual, and then to understand its different aspects, and then to turn to solving it. So it's that perception, that whole problem perception which I think is really important and we neglect it. 
you know, we typically say, oh, you know, the student must know some algebra and they must be able to conjugate a verb, must know an ending and must know sentence structure and on and on. All that's important. I'm not denying it. But in the end, it's what happens when a person puts all those things together. And those kinds of traits, executive functioning, the ability to, to deal with others, and uh, many other things like risk aversion, uh, uh, the ability to cooperate, re reciprocate in a positive way, and so forth and so on, those aspects are neglected in a lot of modern educational research. And that's a serious omission. But it's, it's still the case that these other dimensions are very important. And we've known that historically. And schools taught those. But another major component, another major source of these skills is the family. And I think that's something that people tend to forget as well. So the whole idea of skill has gotten kind of attached to schools and the preeminence of schooling. Schools are very important, no question about it. But on the other hand, it's the quality of the children we send to the school and the support the children get while they're in school and those, those lessons outside of just pure academic lessons that we teach our children. And I think we're gradually becoming aware of it. And we're doing so in a, in a series of studies. I've been working with groups of psychologists and economists and decision makers, a decision theorists, I should say. But these people are really trying to understand just the bundle of traits and skills that together give you effective human beings. Mm -hmm. And so it's the multiplication. So that's, that's what I think is the major new lesson. My original interest was in trying to evaluate a program called the Perry Preschool Program, mm -hmm. a program that was developed in, in the United States, just outside of Detroit, 60 years ago, primarily Black American children, all disadvantaged, three to four years old. And these kids were given an intervention where they went into school every day for plan, do, and review kind of analysis. And those children were, uh, 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 turned out, the IQs of those children at age 10, at least the way they measured the IQ, was no greater for the treatment group than the control group. It was evaluated by a randomized trial. Everybody said, well, the experiment's a failure. But we followed those children now until their mm -hmm. mid-50s. Mm -hmm. The way I have a follow, we have follow-ups. And we not only know what those children did, but what their children did. They had children now. They're in mm -hmm. their 50s. Most of them have children in the 20s, early 30s. And so we can see what the multiple generation effects are. And so what we get out of these kinds of studies is realize, wait, these people are successful in terms of schooling, earnings, reduced participation in crime, and a variety of other, and their health. When we look at the health of these people, we see great Improvements. It wasn't a health-oriented program. So what this does is it opens up thinking about social policy that typically is not done, understood in the whole process of human development, is how giving people these skills that allow them to govern their own lives, mm -hmm. to be able to have uh, self-regulation, to be able to read the instructions, to read the newspapers, to be able to participate in the larger society, what we could see then is they were able to take advantage of all this. And so even though there was not a single health intervention taught, these children are much better in terms of blood pressure, lower obesity, much greater uh, risk of the lower risk, I should say, of mm -hmm. diabetes and a whole series of uh, really dangerous diseases. And this is true in the middle age and now in the later years. Mm -hmm. And so I think we need to think more deeply about what creates our functioning. And I think that's very important. And that, that's that been the thrust of what we've done. But it seems, especially in the modern world, you know, it, what we're getting in the modern world is a lot of change. Change is the, the rule. And we've always had change, but the pace of change is enormous. Technical change in the workplace, mm -hmm. uh, machine learning coming in, AI, but also new technologies being imported and new products being discovered, new trade patterns being, mm -hmm. and then new arrangements with the world trade and, and domestic mm -hmm. internal trade. So there's just a lot of change going on. And it turns out 
that some of these social and emotional skills like executive function allow people to deal with this kind of tax, task complexity that allow them to kind of cope with the multi-dimensional aspect of change. As you said, this is really very cutting edge. Mm. But there's another project that they just heard about from a former student of mine, a co-author named Jorge Garcia. And this is looking at something called IHDP. It's the Infant Health and Development. And uh, they found program. And this takes children that are stunted and then gives them both medical treatment and uh, social and emotional treatments in the sense of, you know, uh, interventions from visitors and uh, mm -hmm. work in centers. And these these children are fathered at least through age 18. And we see very substantial effects. The real danger, like Perry, I mentioned, when it was originally evaluated back in the 1960s, people noticed the IQ rose very quickly during the program. And then it converged back to where the control group was at at age 10. So most people said it was a failure. And then we realized when we followed those people, as we did, thank God, when the data were collected, the National Institute of Health provided some support for allowing us to continue this. And when they were collected, and now we have the data through 55 years of age, we can see that the program was a great success. And if you just do it in pure economic terms mm -hmm. and ask, what is the rate of return? Mm -hmm. What you know, the, a, what is for each rupee invested, if you will, what, how many back, how many do you get back per annum? And the answer is 10% per annum mm. over the whole life of the child. Wow. A huge return. Yeah. A huge, and that's, that's accounting for what a proper, what a good economist would do, not some of these uh, other measures that are out there, but really looking at the social cost of funds and looking at how you can actually create mm -hmm. a, uh, an effective, uh, and effective, uh, and so it really does say that if you take resources from another part of the economy mm -hmm. and put it in here, you're mm -hmm. going to get a very high rate of return. Mm -hmm. On ABC, where we're able to measure the health benefits even more, we got a 14% rate of return per annum. Per annum, that, it's not just 14% one year; it's 14% every year from the date of inception of the program. But meanwhile. What we've done is something else. I've been working very much now with a group of people uh, in Jamaica. There's a woman named uh, Sally Grantham McGregor. Mm -hmm. She's now Dame Sally Grantham McGregor. She is. Uh, uh, she was made a Dame of the British Empire oh about a year or two ago. She founded a program in Jamaica that was targeting stunted children, and the program was designed to look at the structure of, uh, of, uh, of, of what interventions would work. So mm -hmm. there was a nutrition arm, there was just a pure cognitive stimulation arm, mm -hmm. and then there was a combination of both arms. Mm -hmm. And people were randomly assigned, then there was a control group. They were randomly assigned. Now, I've been analyzing the Jamaican data with them in the last 10 years, and we now have the children followed to age 34. So they're still young. But it's mm -hmm. still old enough to get meeting, readings on their adult earnings, their education, and the like. And what we see is substantial impact of those programs. And the beautiful thing about these programs is, is that they represent a much less costly way mm -hmm. to intervene. Mm -hmm. And what are the skills that are produced? Exactly the same executive functioning, IQ, various measures of social and emotional skills as well as things like education, reduced crime, higher earnings, better occupation, and so forth. And in the case of Jamaican, it, it's also meeting as a ticket for some of these children to migrate either to the United Kingdom or to the United States and do better, go to school and so forth. So what's happened is that uh, these programs, and the reason why I like these programs so much, is that they're much less costly than the Perry and ABC programs. Mm -hmm. They cost about 5% of what these other programs do. And they're producing benefits that are very substantial in many ways on par. But in this case, I think it's really important that what we've isolated, and all these programs have many features. They will, you know, they will do things like I mentioned, Perry will take kids in, and the kids each day will plan, do, and review a project. 
And by review, mm -hmm. I mean they will review with their peers. They will actually create a structure of uh, they will create a structure of uh, of assessment. So they're sitting around the table, and the projects are very simple, like drawing a picture or making a toy car or or you know maybe fixing a doll or something something mm -hmm. simple, but nonetheless requiring some planning, some execution, and then amenable to review. Well. Those are very useful traits. And that's all center-based. And centers are costly to set up and so forth and so on. So what did we learn? Well, when we isolate these components, the Jamaican program only took one component. And I forgot to mention, Harry had home visits. Mm -hmm. And the ABC mm -hmm. program bought, brought the parents in to the center. So there was interaction with the parent. So it turns out these home visiting programs have only one feature. And that is, they are working with the parent. They engage the parent, they give the parent suggestions, how they can play with their children, how they can stimulate their children and so forth. So Jamaica was a marvel because here was a slums of Kingston, they had no money. The Ford Foundation spotted them a little bit, but not much. And what they did is they taught the mothers to actually make playbooks out of material in the dumps. So they had to went to the garbage dump, just get paper, waste products, make books the children could read, and then teach the mother to interact with the child. Just interact. They didn't tell the mother what to do. The visitors were not particularly well trained. The visitors were of the same level of education and background as the mothers or caregivers they visited. And it turned out that these programs have turned out very effective at 34. So as a result of this, a whole series of programs have been launched around the world. But what comes out of it then is very fascinating that you're getting substantial growth in skills. This is in fine motor skill, in cognition, in language, and in the ability to deal with others in social and emotional skills. So this, this is a very low cost intervention and it's highly effective. First five years of life of the child are crucial. And if we can get the parents actively engaged, that parents don't have to be that highly educated. But programs like this have also been launched in Colombia mm -hmm. to some success. Mm -hmm. And now they're being tried out in India, Odisha, mm -hmm. I think. And mm -hmm. uh, so Odisha. So what you're getting is a, is a, and then Nepal and soon uh, in Brazil for sure. And there's some, 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 uh, some discussion, I think, in, in Kenya are uh, proposing these programs. But the mm -hmm. thing about it is that it gets to what I think is the essence of child development, which is parent-child engagement. Mm -hmm. And turning the parent on to the parent's own possibility. It's surprising, but many disadvantaged parents, either for cultural reasons or just pure ignorance, don't realize the power that they have mm -hmm. to build skills in their children. And once they're given that knowledge, they use it. And the children are very, very well adapted. And so it's, and again, it's also lessons that are more than just cognition, but it includes cognition. Mm -hmm. So the crucial thing is that parent-child bond. Mm -hmm. So there's, I have a colleague at the Rice, former student named Flavio Cunha. He's done a lot of very important work. And he asks disadvantaged mothers. These are in Philadelphia and in Houston now. He's asking these mothers, just what do you think is the normal trajectory of growth for a child, for learning, reading, self-control? And a lot of them don't know. They can't monitor their own children. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, I think there's tremendous amount of, uh, uh, that. There's, that so very low cost interventions can be very effective. I also, I, I was also reading, uh, you know, some of some of the experiences that you shared when you when you uh, were awarded your Nobel Prize, um, and and something really stayed in my mind. You said you you actually witnessed racial discrimination in in America's South in the nineteen sixties. So I wanted to ask you about that, and also whether in that, you know, now we've we've already got a fairly good idea of how deep your commitment is to reduce inequalities between human beings at their very core. Now, did witnessing that kind of discrimination, was that also an influence on, 
on, on your work and this, this amazing passionate commitment of yours? Well, it certainly changed my life perspective. I, I was born in Chicago, Illinois. Yeah. But about age, I guess, 11 or 12, I went down to, uh, my father uh, was working for a large company and they transferred him to a town called Lexington, Kentucky. It's in the middle of Kentucky. It's the horse, it's the horse uh, breeding region of Kentucky, the bluegrass, they call it. Mm -hmm. But he wasn't in horses, he was in the meatpacking actually. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I went there with my sister and uh, we, at that time, and this is in the mid fifties now, that the, um, the uh, late fifties maybe, but the, the, the system of Jim Crow's racial segregation mm -hmm. was very much in evidence. And coming from Chicago where it wasn't in evidence and then going down to Lexington really opened my eyes uh, in, in a way that I, I, I never, and my sisters too. So what, what happened, I remember the first time two incidents occurred when we moved to Lexington. First was that we, my sister and I were taking a bus from our neighborhood to downtown Lexington. We lived maybe, maybe two or three miles outside, but there was a good bus line. Mm -hmm. And so we just took the bus and, and we went off to, uh, to see the town together. We just arrived and, and my sister and I went and we loved the, the, you know, the back bay window of a bus, some mm. of these buses. That, mm. And so the bay window gives you a full view. Yeah. Since we were newcomers, we wanted to see as much as we could. So we went immediately to the back of the bus. Ah, well, we noticed two things. One is the bus in that area. There were mostly black people. They're all only black people. But that didn't bother us. We sat down with them and we were just looking out the window. It was our purpose. Then the bus driver saw us do this and stopped the bus and said, no, you're not supposed to sit there. You're supposed to sit in this part of the bus. So I said, well, that's very strange. So we complied. We were little kids. We weren't trying to fight the law, but we just were amazed by that. And then when I went into Lexington, not just that trip, but in other trips, I became aware that in the parks of Lexington, Kentucky, there were benches just benches in the park where people would sit down to admire mm -hmm. the flowers or the birds mm -hmm. or whatever else was in the park. And, uh, and there were white benches and it said whites only and blacks only, which again surprised me. And the same was true of the water fountains. And then when you went to a, to a bathroom, say in a bus station or, or even a bathroom in a, some kind of public facility, there were whites only or blacks only. And then you went to a movie theater then the blacks were supposed to sit up in the upper seats and the whites sat in the lower seats. And it was very rigidly enforced. I remember when my parents arrived, a visitor from the neighborhood came to us and said, and explained to us what he called the Southern way of life. And he said, you know, we know you guys are from the North, you guys are Yankees. And so we'll, we'll give you some little bit of knowledge about the Southern way of life. And it was exactly that way about keeping the distance between you and the blacks. When I was in eight, I went, I started school there in the seventh grade. And uh, I remember the school was segregated, completely segregated. There were blacks living in the area, a lot of them, but they went to a separate school. I never saw a black in that school and it was racially segregated. Mm -hmm. And so I, I was very taken aback by all that, just surprised. So that just kind of left to me a, uh, kind of an experience, and I became aware of something. Yeah, I didn't enjoy that, uh, but I wasn't a social activist either at age 11. You're not gonna, mm -hmm. you're gonna all take it all in. And then the next year, my parents moved once more to, from Kentucky over to Oklahoma. Oklahoma was still a Southern state. And again, I witnessed the same thing. You take a, go to a bus station or a train station or whatever, mode of transportation you were using or going to a movie theater. And again, it was very racially separated. The blacks were over there. The whites were over there. I was white and we kept our distance. Big, big social code. So that stuck in my memory. And I got fascinated by what was going on in the black community. I hadn't met that many blacks because remember, we're very segregated. I actually found myself uh, very interested in uh, in the black community there, small, hardly representative. 
So I went to a lot of black churches and I tried to find out about black culture. And this is already now in the early 60s. And there was, you know, the civil rights movement was starting to really heat up in the U.S. King, Martin Luther King was active and so forth. So I got very interested in black culture. I went to some black churches just to get used to it. And then, and then you know, the U.S. passed a whole series of civil rights laws. And then I went on to graduate school and I got very interested in the issues of human capital and wage growth and skill accumulation. That fascinated me. Was we passed a civil rights law in 1964. Mm -hmm. And then the civil rights law, we started seeing really great change in the status of African Americans. So I became very deeply conversant with the question of how, you know, what caused that change? There was a lot of discussion. What happened is I got drawn into the issue of trying to explain the growth in Black economic progress mm -hmm. between the 1960s and when, when I started going back to this in the early 80s. And I became, a, and then I realized there was this huge debate. There had been this papers written by people I really respected saying that this was all due to things like the forces of education, secular economic growth, and the law had no effect whatsoever. So I became deeply interested. And I, go, I really wanted to investigate it. So off and on, it wasn't my only task. But over that period of 10 years or so, nine years actually, I gathered together massive amounts of data documenting this breakthrough that Blacks experienced. Even data from segregation states, states that collected data on individual firms asking how they complied with the mm -hmm. segregation laws, which were in place. You couldn't hire a Black, a Black couldn't work in the assembly lines, could work outdoor, could clean toilets, but it was a very rigid social code. and. Uh, I put all this together and I reached the conclusion. It's a paper that I really like the best and nobody even knows I wrote it. So, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's like one of these papers that I'm personally proud of. And I truly, I felt I proved once and for all that this was due. The civil rights law played a huge role. And the timing, the region, the location, the breakthrough, everything put together. And I, I will say this, I still have this letter. At the time I published this in a major journal, Robert Solo at MIT, still alive, very, very influential economist, mm. and a guy who mattered a lot in my life, just thought, you know, I respected him, wrote me a letter and told me uh, something which I really valued then and still value now. He said, this is the model for good empirical work in economics. So I really went through it because I took what I call the abductive approach using all sources of evidence. It wasn't just feeding a single econometric model. It wasn't a single data set. We read newspapers. I read the whole history of the uh, Department of Labor, the state of mm -hmm. South Carolina between 1915, when they set up their segregation code to 1965, 50, uh, oh, 40, uh, 50 years, I guess, of, uh, of, of documentary about the enforcement of the law and what happened, because it gave me background. And when we were doing the study, I went down to the University of South Carolina on an invitation, and I got the, the leader of the school, the chairman of the department, to bring together a group of industrialists and people who had lived through this. I gave them my story and I asked, how well does mm -hmm. this accord with what you experienced personally? And it passed the test. So I was very happy. It was, that, I think, is the right way to do empirical research in economics. <laughs> India, of course, as you know far better than I do, has one of the world's youngest populations. Uh, we're yes. also going to be the most populous nation uh, on the globe in, in within a year's time. Um, yes. Now, what the, the, the sort of talk that we've had with you today, there's so much uh, for policymakers to, to draw from your insights. There's so much for decision makers to draw from your insights about the importance of interventions uh, in particularly in the, the early childhood um, of individuals to strengthen their lives. But, but I wanted to ask you, speaking directly to billions of young Indians who are seeking to thrive, what advice would you give them? Well, in what stage are they? I mean, are they are they living in poor rural areas? Are they living in in uh, 
uh, New Delhi, say, uh, where there's affluence or at least access to public facilities. I mean, the thing about India that strikes me from outside, and remember, I'm completely ignorant. I mean, first of all, the diversity in India is amazing. Mm. I mean, I mean, the different cultural groups. I mean, the British were very smart in some ways by playing one group of Indians off against the other so they could keep the Raj going. Uh, and it was probably a bad legacy, though. I, I, tension is not the right word, maybe, but friction, maybe, mm -hmm. that's kind of built in. Uh, and, of course, there's the issue of the structure of the caste system, how much that really impairs the, mm -hmm. the mobility of children. Uh, you know, I know Amartya Sen pretty well, and I know that he writes a lot mm -hmm. about this one province in southern India. What is it called? The, Kerala? Oh, yes, Kerala. Yeah. It had a communist government, but it had a lot of opportunity for women, and it had a lot of progressive uh, legislation. I don't know how well that's going now. Actually, I heard I heard conflicting stories, but I haven't mm -hmm. really investigated. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen a marcher for a while. But the but the interesting thing there in India is this diversity of culture. And my advice for young children is, I mean, the Indians who have been given the opportunity to I mean, here in the United States, uh, the Indian Americans are very mm. successful. Mm. And if you look at the Indian immigrants, if you look at the Indian academics and the whole mm. world stage, whether it's mathematics, physics, uh, economics, uh, chemistry, uh, and literature too, the Bengali mm. literature is very good. Uh, and the, the even the films, I remember the, mm. seeing the, the sequence on the world of Apu and the, the filmmaker. Uh, and, you know, Ray. Tagora, yes, yeah, Ray, and really yes. amazing films. And so, you know, India has so much potential and so much history. So it's not like it never flourished. It flourished and then some. Mm -hmm. There recently was a documentary here in the United States, NOVA. Do you know the NOVA series? And it's put out mm -hmm. by the National Science Foundation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it was on, it was a very good film. I love these NOVAs, even though they're targeted towards probably high school children or college. I still watch them because they teach me some new things that I just didn't know. I'm not old enough. I'm not so old I can't learn. But this was fascinating in the sense that we're asking, where did the number zero come from? Well, it came from Indian mathematicians. Zero was a concept very closely related to the Buddhist and Hindu concept of nothingness, you know, mm -hmm. but it wasn't there in the Greek or Roman system or the Chinese systems either. It was very, very interesting. But anyway, the point is, India has made such contributions to the world and will continue to make those contributions. I mean, so, I mean, a young child, the real, the crucial thing is to try to get right to the source of knowledge. And the trouble is, I know, speaking with many of my friends who go to India often, who run projects for NGOs, that there's a lot of rigidity built into the school system. And so it stifles the creativity, and it stifles learning opportunity. I think India, I mean, I can't ask the advice for young children. I would say, I would say, go back to the great Indian in history and realize the great potential and the great history of creativity and productivity mm -hmm. that Indian culture has brought to the world. I mean, not just in religion, not just in mathematics, in literature, in a many, many dimensions. So I think respecting that and realizing that is extremely important. Mm -hmm. But I also think that it's it's somewhat, but I would say try as best you can to teach yourself things, even outside of school, or try hard to mm -hmm. push your curiosity. That really we know that those people who are the most curious learn. You know, what we have this American president, Abraham Lincoln, mm -hmm. very famous guy, very well respected. Uh, he had one year of school. So by all accounts, he was a pretty bad physician. But he was curious. And he studied. And he studied like crazy. And he took on all these challenges. And the important thing, I think, is basically realizing that you have potential. And uh, although I don't care much for this literature, there is some work by a psychologist at uh, Stanford. Mm -hmm. uh, I care very much about what she does show. She has this whole program that she wants children 
to understand their capacity to learn. And so her notion is the mind is a muscle. That's her phrase. But what she means is we can exercise it and we can build strength. And I think the children should recognize that whatever they know, whatever their position in, is in, that by exerting their curiosity, by trying hard things and willing to fail. See, that's the, it's, I think that's the part that we don't teach children enough and people enough, adults even. Try new things, trying new things, even though some of them may be wrong and may be harmful to an extent. They may be at least unpleasant. But the structure is that when we learn from our failures, and then we, when we when we try, when our, we reach, even if our reach exceeds our grasp, the very act of reaching elevates us quite literally, but also challenges us. And it's that notion of continual challenge, not thinking that the world is no completely known or that there's no possibility for you. There are enormous possibilities, even in some of the most desperate looking situations. But it's just a matter of kind of pursuing it hard, being open to new ideas and being willing to take a risk. You know, a few years ago here in Chicago, Jack Ma from uh, mm-hmm. uh, from the, I think it's Tencent, whatever the, the company is. Alibaba, you're right. Tencent's a different company. Yeah. Alibaba. He came here and there was a group of us that met with him. Just a, it was a group. I didn't meet with him in person, but he was there. We talked briefly. The important thing is, is he said, what does he do at Alibaba? He says he has a whole university in Alibaba for his employees, an institute, really. And that is he teaches his employees to fail. And everybody said, what? Fail? You know, it's successful. Mm-hmm. And what he means is to try new things, that they can try new things and then, having failed, try something else. So it's the ability to kind of be resilient. That's a learned trait. And if the, the point is not to kind of, you know, to, to kind of characterize yourself by one, two, or even three or four failures. You just keep trying and keep challenging. And then recognize it, it's, it's something that I found in my life. I honestly found that whenever I learned something, whatever it was, however obscure, you know, Latin conjugation, some piece of physical chemistry, some anthropology that I took as an undergraduate or some physics that having to do with uh, the rolling of a ball down a plane or the hanging of a bridge, the so-called brachistochrome problem, the hanging of a chain over the bridge, suspension of a bridge, all those things that seem very, very obscure, I always used. At some point I came back and they created a frame and I could draw on those things. And that was true of poetry, it was true of novels, it was true of plays, because those are worlds (coughs) about possibilities. And that's what we're all about, right? Counterfactual world, the world of the possible. So a good novelist is really drawing out perceptions. And so not to privilege one source of knowledge Mm -hmm. and to be open to knowledge from all sources and also to be able to, to fail. I failed plenty of times. And I, you know, fail, I want to do something. I, I want to, something to succeed. And then in the end, I realized it wouldn't succeed. But every one of those failures, however bad they were, led to something down the line that I could use and then led to some virtue. Some, maybe not uh, what I'd hoped for, but it led to something that was useful and it certainly helped shape my experience. So I'm kind of grateful for the chance to be able to fail. And, uh, and and I failed plenty, but I think I would just, so I'm not telling people to go out and fail <laughs> because <laughs> that would be too easy. I think what I'm telling people is to go out and try new things because you see, I have a theory about how we develop as people. To me, as people, starting from little children, we're always trying ourselves out. We're trying new roles. You know, a little kid, I'm going to be this, I'm going to be that. I'm going to be a fireman or a police chief. I'm going to do this. So you're going to do all these different things. And so little kids in their play are really doing counterfactual worlds. And then when we get older, we try different things. You know, I was seriously interested in the philosophy of science for a while. 
took some paper, took some courses on it, wrote some papers on it, then decided, no, wasn't for me. But I learned a lot from that. And I, I still draw on it to this day in, in some of the work I do in causality. So it's, it's you can't, knowledge takes an unpredictable course, but knowledge, but learning new things can never hurt unless it's fentanyl or <coughs> some drug that's uh, very dangerous <laughs> that you don't want to learn. No, <laughs> thank you so much, Professor Hickman. Okay, thank you well, very good so very and uh, good luck. Thank okay, you thank very you. much and I'll be done. Thank you very, very much.